And first, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, as Betsy said, this is the third of our bi-monthly webinar series. Our final one will be in early October, given by the members of the, of the CPIN leadership team. So please stay, stay tuned for the announcement of the date and time. Um, today's theme is user's need. It is our great pleasure to have Dr. Heyo Aiken and Dr. Adrian Taiwi to give the CPIN webinar today. Heyo received his diploma degree in mineralogy from the Technical University of Klausel, Germany in 1988, and two years later, in 1990, he received his PhD degree in natural science from the University of Bremen, Germany. Currently, he is a professor of geophysics and the IARC interim director at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, UAS. His research focuses on sea ice geophysics and the importance of polar ice covers as a social environmental system, systems. He has helped build an integrated sea ice observatory in northern Alaska as an interface between geophysical and local knowledge of ice conditions and hazards. He has an effort at UAF to enhance use of scientific data by stakeholders building on work conducted during the International Polar Year. As the chair of the Science Steering Committee of the U.S. Study of Environmental Arctic Change, Search. He works towards the establishment of an observing network to improve understanding and responses to rapid Arctic change. The other speaker, Dr. Adrian Tavi, received her Bachelor of Science Engineering in Mining Engineering degree from the Department of Applied Science, Queen's University in 1998 and a Master of Science in Atmospheric Science from the UAF in 2001, and a PhD in 2009 from the University of Calgary. She joined the Canadian Ice Service a year ago and is leading the long-term, long-range CS forecasting program. Before joining the CS Service, Adrian worked on industry-related ice forecasting and ice engineering problems as a research scientist with the National Research Council of Canada. She has also worked as an operational sea ice forecaster, supporting the offshore oil industry in the Beaufort Sea and the Sea of Outcast. As um, uh, Betty said, unfortunately, Adrian cannot join us today, but she pre-recorded her presentation, and uh, so this will be a challenge for us, and uh, we will play the audio embedded PPT file if you have problems, you can click the chat window to send the, um, the questions or problems incur when her presentation was played. So without further ado, now let's hear Heyo's presentation. Please go ahead, Heyo. Thank you, uh, Mo Yen, for the uh, introduction and, and welcome, everybody. Um, so this is a, uh, um, a two-part presentation. I just want to start out with uh, a bit of background information and a few broader questions in regards to why uh, or, or what the motivation is to even look at sub-seasonal or seasonal CS prediction from the perspective of, of different merits and the potential. Uh, talk a bit about uh, prediction goals and, and the actual target variables that are to be predicted. And I'll use um, both this year's uh, CS breakup season in the Pacific Arctic sector um, and uh, past freeze-ups as an illustration of some of the some of the some of the challenges and, and some of the in interesting uh, research that's um, uh, buried in that question. And then the the final part of the presentation is a brief look at um, guidance on potential observations in support of uh, seasonal ice prediction. And then I'll hand it over to a pre-recorded Adrienne who will focus in more detail on the. Uh, uh, on the industry needs and some of the work that she's been doing through the Canadian Ice Service. Um, so just briefly, CS Prediction Network goals um, included, in addition to the fundamental research looking at predictability on uh, seasonal and longer time scales, also the question to what an extent the, um, uh, some of the variables that are more relevant in an operational context 
can be examined by, by the groups that are part of the CS prediction network. And um, what I want to make clear, though, is that uh, SIPN, the CS Prediction Network, is a collaborative research project. We are not a, a, a formal forecasting system. We're not a forecasting service. And so everything you see in here, including Adrienne's presentation later on, is uh, motivated and, and contained within the context of research to explore different approaches, new approaches to, to key aspects of uh, CS prediction in the Arctic. Uh, at the same time, um, I also want to make clear that we, we cannot and do not represent or speak for the private sector or specific industries. Um, but again, the, uh, the, the two presentations today are shared in the context of, uh, of a broader research collaboration network. And Adrienne will, will actually cover that in a bit more detail of uh, what, what, what that means specifically. <clears throat> um, and then um, you, you see on this slide here as well some of the more specific goals for the SIPN network, but I, I want to jump uh, right in and um, essentially uh, just briefly review where we see some of the research that you would uh, consider is, is part of uh, a traditional Arctic system science that looks at, for example, climate data records and uh, variables that describe the state of the Arctic system and its change. And, and how that research that takes place here on the, on the right-hand side of this diagram, how that is or, or isn't linked to um, what the applied research world is interested in. And that is focused mostly on whatever it is that different stakeholder groups would like to see happen or not happen, so, so technically referred to as stakeholder desired outcomes. And where we see SIPN um, play a potential role in the exchange of information and, and potential collaboration between these two worlds is to examine a bit more detail the specific requirements, the interests, and the relevance of some of the um, uh, research CS prediction products that are being generated by teams collaborating and contributing to the SIPN uh, activities as part of the CS outlook in particular, uh, exploring how that might be relevant in, in an operational context. And at the same time, also asking the question, and that's what Adrienne's presentation will be focusing on, what specifically are stakeholder desired outcomes in the context of, of major stakeholders that the Canadian Ice Service deals with, and what does that mean uh, for the types of observations, the types of predictions that are, are uh, relevant um, in, in that setting. Um, so the first question to ask is, well, why um, actually consider seasonal scale prediction at all and I just want to highlight uh, two aspects of that. One is, as you're well aware, and, and this is represented here in the figure by the, the mean uh, distribution of ice of different age derived from uh, ice uh, velocity vector fields. As, as you're well aware, um, we have a reservoir of, of though shrinking, a remaining reservoir of old, thick, multi-year ice uh, north in the uh, high Canadian Arctic and in the eastern Beaufort Sea. And as that ice is advected into the western Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea, basically the Pacific sector of the Arctic Ocean, associated with that uh, comes the potential for predictive skill in seasonal scale prediction of ice conditions in areas of interest to different stakeholders. And in particular, uh, one area that we will focus on today, outlined here by this, this white rectangle, areas that are seeing increasing activities both from the perspective of maritime traffic along the shore here and uh, offshore um, oil and gas exploration, in particular in the Chukchi Sea sector, where there's a number of vessels out there uh, uh, as we speak. Um, so these various, um, uh, so, so the distribution of this, this multi-year ice provides some, um, some potential for seasonal scale, predictive skill. That's, that's been well established, but is, is, is one key motivation. The other, um, illustrated by this example here, is that not just even, but in particular, as we're seeing significant changes in the, uh, the seasonal ice cycle, delayed onset of freeze up in the fall compared to climatology over, over the past three decades or so, we're also starting to see an increasing need for a more quantitative and a more rigorous look at long range prediction. Uh, the photo that you see here is of the uh, of the tanker Renda, 
that was escorted into the community of Nome in, in the winter of 2011-2012 uh, to resupply the community. The reason why Nome required additional fuel oil was um, uh, significantly uh, associated with um, what was turned by the, um, uh, by the, by the uh, original commercial enterprise that was supposed to be providing fuel by an early freeze-up, anonymously early freeze-up, and a storm that delayed the, uh, the fuel supply by, by standard barge in the fall. And as a result, um, this, this later resupply was made necessary. And, and as subsequent conversations and, and uh, uh, settlement uh, illustrated, uh, th this was this was an interesting example where um, parts of the private sector had already planned with delayed freeze up and were not aware um, or fully cognizant of the range of variation that you can expect in freeze up in the fall and what that means for for uh, supply of coastal communities. So there is a clear potential role uh, for for subseasonal prediction, in particular in the context of this greater variability that we're seeing in the seasonal ice cycle. Um, and the other, other thing I want to briefly uh, just highlight and refer to is that in, in the work that we'll be reporting on here today, um, we've been drawing on a number of documents that provide excellent summaries of, of the broader problem of, of seasonal or subseasonal to, to all the way to decadal scale predictions. In particular, the National Academy study, the report edited by Jackie Richter Mengi and John Walsh uh, that's referenced here is an excellent resource. And there is um, some discussion of, of industry information needs in there as well. The same is true for the NOAA CS forecasting workshop summary that's available through NOAA. Um, the, the Academy's report actually references much of that material. And then I also want to draw your attention to a project I'll, I'll talk a bit more about um, here in a minute as well, the EU Access Project that generated a very interesting assessment of uh, monitoring forecasting requirements uh, from users in the in the European and and uh, or Eurasian sector of the Arctic that we relied on, but what's interesting is and that's in part a motivation for for this webinar here and potential follow-on work, is that um, while there's a clear understanding that seasonal scale prediction is is going to lead to an improved risk analysis for various types of maritime activities um, and potentially better planning of operation, um, there's quite a bit of um, uh, room still to explore what specifically are the information needs of the private sector and how does that tie into ongoing efforts that may help shed light on um, the, um, the potential for, for improved prediction. If you, if you review some of these documents, you find that it, it's not clearly stated, but, but this is something that came out in the interviews Adrienne conducted, that w one of the key questions is, uh, what, what is the actual predictive skill quantitatively, and how does that relate to how, how various parts of industry are making decisions? And, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail here in a minute. The, the other key point uh, I'd, I'd like to make um, that is, is relevant in, in the context of this theme is that if you look at some of the products that contributors to the Arctic Sea Ice Outlook uh, have provided over the years, the focus there clearly is on ice extent um, and at the regional level, ice concentration, although recently uh, some other, other products have been provided. But from a perspective of, of industry, private sector, or stakeholder information needs, um, the, the specific variable that's relevant here is very much tied to either a hazard or a threat that needs to be avoided or to um, ease of operations, if you will, in the absence of, of hazards or threats. And um, you, you see that highlighted here in the slide for various types of, of industry, whether it's shipping, coastal offshore uh, um, infrastructure, emergency response. Um, there's, there's a number of different variables <clears throat> that move beyond just simple ice concentration fields, such as, um, in particular, of course, ice thickness, a, a key element, ice velocity here. Um, um, uh, ice convergent in the, uh, convergence in the context of shipping, and, and clearly identifying the, the variable that, that needs to be predicted is, is an important aspect of, of seasonal scale prediction where, where there's quite a bit of progress to be made. Um, if you um, look at this in more detail, I'd just like to illustrate this a bit more um, by reviewing key elements or, or key dates in the seasonal cycle. 
and and those are uh, illustrated here for the uh, for the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea coast based on uh, detailed analysis of high-resolution radars, synthetic aperture radar, satellite data by, by Andy Mahoney and others, um, where the, um, uh, the, the, the four key dates, if you will, in the seasonal cycle here are, are illustrated as the first appearance of ice along the coast, uh, the first presence of stable ice, ice that persists throughout the stable ice season, then breakup in the spring, and finally, um, and, and this overlaps in part, uh, um, uh, ice-free conditions. And what you notice here already in, in this graphic is that you see significant regional variability between the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea. Uh, you also see substantial interannual variability as you go from the late 1990s into the late 2000s. Um, but you also see that different dates um, have different um, uncertainties or, or, or variances associated with them. Um, one of the key things that stands out is that, in particular in the Beaufort Sea, um, the, the, the bounds on standard deviation of uh, appearance of first ice along the entire coast. So for each year, um, the, the standard deviation here describes the, uh, uh, the standard deviation amongst data collected along this entire stretch of coastline is much narrower, for example, than that of, of breakup. And that's, that's, a, uh, that's a persistent feature here in the Beaufort Sea. Um, the other, uh, other thing to keep in mind is, and, and so um, I, I want to illustrate that here briefly with two animations that show the progress of breakup this year at Barrow. Uh, what you see on the left is a, um, an animation based on radar imagery collected at, at um, our Barrow uh, CS Observatory. And so you see over the course of, of a couple of days, June 26th through 28th, you see how the, the stable shorefast ice here uh, starts to break up, uh, overall ice conditions or ice concentration decreases, and the same thing is, is uh, visible here in, uh, over a smaller scale in the image on the right that shows an animation from, from the web page. So what needs to be clearly established from a uh, stakeholder perspective, whether it's industry or local users, is what specifically are you uh, trying to predict um, and, and what is the specific use of, say, this coastal uh, ocean environment that this is relevant for. For somebody who's going out with a small craft, and in, in some coastal communities, even uh, some, of the, some of the barge supplies can actually take place in the presence of small amounts of sea ice, such as what you see present here now uh, in, the, in the webcam images on the right. Um, that may be very different if you have large vessels that are not ice strengthened, where any contact with ice, no matter what type, uh, may be an issue. And, and being very clear about, uh, for instance, in the context of breakup, what the scale is over which <clears throat> you are um, uh, asked to be providing a prediction of a specific ice variable, as well as what that specific variable is, is, is critically important. That's, that's also illustrated in, in um, actually this slide here, which shows you um, the, uh, a suite of, of four information products, if you will, starting at the bottom here with the uh, NSIDC National Ice Center Multi-Sensor Analyzed CS Extent Product, or MAZI, for the same time period. And again, you already, you already see that here with the scale, a lot of the fine detail for the same day that you're seeing here is, is, is not preserved. You see that there's some um, uh, reduced corridor uh, of ice, or, or a corridor of reduced ice concentration here. But what, in fact, this looks like comes out more clearly in MODIS imagery. Um, uh, acquired at, at the uh, half kilometer scale here. Um, this is actually a day later, so, so there's been a bit of advection of, of open water here um, uh, as a result of cloudiness. And then, of course, uh, you've already seen this here at, at the scale of, for example, an individual vessel or a specific uh, community access point. Uh, this looks, looks, looks very much different as well. And so between these different scales, you may actually find significant differences in the um, in the date uh, forecasted or predicted for seasonal breakup. And that is something that's, that's also reflected in this year's um, proxy for breakup that we looked at. So what, what I'm showing you here is uh, shared courtesy of uh, Edward Blanchard Rigglesworth, who's been um, working on the predictability component of the, uh, of the CS prediction network. He and, and a small group of contributors, three of which 
are illustrated here have looked at the the uh, uh, prediction. So this is for the for the um, June outlook for the for the Arctic CS outlook. So these are um, uh, looking forward with with a uh, um, with with a start date of uh, late May, effectively. And what you see here is significant spread in the, in the proxy for breakup, which here is defined as the first day at which a grid cell is predicted to have less than 15% ice concentration. Um, and, and you'll notice that there are significant differences here. Many of them explain both by differences in the resolution of these models as well as in um, model inherent uncertainties or biases. But it's interesting to note that overall spatial patterns uh, captured here, uh, illustrated, for example, by this, this contribution from NASA by Clather et al., um, you, you actually find that some of these, these spatial patterns uh, predicted here are actually quite um, um, or, or match well what, what's being observed with uh, earlier breakup here in the, in the Western Chukchi, uh, sorry, Eastern Chukchi Sea compared to the Western Beaufort Sea. And, and specific patterns with regards to lingering of ice uh, northeast of Barrow. Um, so there's quite a bit of, of room here to ask more specifically how breakup forecasts and, and other key dates in the seasonal cycle can be better matched up between the information needs by industry or stakeholders and um, that of what the models can provide. Um, just as a uh, sort of an, as, as an illustration as to how far this can be pushed at the subseasonal scale, once you've clearly defined what specific aspect of breakup you're interested in, um, uh, a study by Petrich et al. that um, built on, on some of our work at the Barrow Ice Observatory showed that for, for a, a very part, for a specific location, you're able in many years to predict the uh, actual date of forecast, which is based on a criterion developed by the local stakeholder, which relates to a boat or vessel access on the beach, uh, to within plus minus one days, um, uh, uh, two weeks in advance. If you know, and, and that's interesting in this case here, if you have data or time series on the uh, shortwave irradiance at this site. If you're interested in this, um, I, I'd refer you to the, uh, um, to the paper that's um, highlighted here. Um, just, just as a, uh, an additional um, note here is that the same applies for the breakup, uh, sorry, for the freeze-up season. So what you see here is um, relevant from an operational perspective. This is historical data, if you will, from the 2012 uh, exploration drilling season in the Chukchi Sea. You see the various leases here in the region, and you see for the 14th of November 2012, the ice edge or ice advancing freeze up front um, as shown by the, uh, uh, by, by the NOAA Arctic Environmental Response Management Application PERMA that's ingesting ice center, national ice center data. Um, the, uh, I, I want to point out that the um, National Weather Service Ice Desk in Anchorage is providing seasonal scale weather and sea ice outlooks, um, as well as, of course, a more detailed short term forecast. Um, and of course, all of this information currently is relevant um, because a, another major drill season is underway in the Chukchi Sea. And again, that's one of the motivating factors for seasonal scale forecasts because they play an important role in an operational context. Um, and again, just as a, as a sort of an illustration or a note of caution for a specific site, this here is Barrow, um, based on uh, an operational definition that determines the last day of navigation past Barrow um, from the National Ice Center longer time series here compared with local observations uh, over the past three decades or so at Barrow compared with passive microwave satellite data derived um, uh, freeze up observations. You see that there's significant divergence here. And again, this just points to the importance of differences in scale and definitions of freeze up based on the, on the method um, of of data acquisition. And of course, that then would also enter into any type of seasonal scale prediction, in particular those that are, are, are building on statistical models. So the final point here, just, just a few more slides um, before I wrap up, is the question, um, what about uh, observations that inform uh, in terms of initialization or, or constrain in some form seasonal uh, scale forecasts? 
I just want to briefly um, uh, highlight a few results of, of a paper that you can access here by uh, Kaminsky and others looking at this uh, from the perspective of um, comparing two transects, hypothetical transects, um, but hypothetical in the sense that these line up with parts of NASA's Ice Bridge program that acquires um, information about ice surface elevation and, and derived thickness. As you may be aware, some of this data in recent years has been made available as a quick look product and has entered into some of the, uh, some of the Arctic Sea Ice Outlook contributions by, by different uh, modeling groups. And so the question that was asked here is, um, can um, we get insight from uh, model-based evaluations on the relative value or relative merit of measurements of ice thickness along these two profiles? Um, and that, of course, in, in the context of, of, the, um, of, of the webinar today, uh, I'd like to just focus on one specific aspect, and that asked specifically to what an extent uh, data on ice thickness along these transects on the first, collected on the 1st of April have relevance uh, from an operational perspective um, later in the summer, um, uh, in the July and August timeframe. And this is based on essentially deconstructing the Barnett Ice Severity Index, which is a measure of trafficability that's used quite a bit by industry in the region, uh, extracting predicted variables from that as well as looking at ice conditions over the Chukchi Sea lease areas. And so uh, in this study, um, the, the relative uh, reduc reduction in uncertainty for the, the Chukchi Sea lease area by an ice thickness profile flown in, uh, on the 1st of April from the Chukchi Sea to the Fram Strait was evaluated over a time scale of 10 days, 90, 91 days, and 153 days. And what you see here, and again, this is mostly uh, just a teaser um, for you to look at this in more detail in, in the publication, but what you see, of course, is a substantial decay in the, in the predictive skill associated with the data. Uh, but what's more interesting is um, that the, the broader study nicely shows that if you, if you do plan observations uh, with, with both the, the question of can we assess the overall mass budget of the Arctic ice cover, the, goal, the primary goal of the Ice Bridge program, of course, and at the same time provide data that's relevant in a seasonal predictions scale from, a, from an applied perspective, uh, the answer is that, that, that that's actually a cautious yes, uh, provided that you look at this in more detail from the perspective of, of, the, um, of the target region and the target variables. Uh, and again, this slide here, I'll, I'll just put up briefly, uh, just illustrates that, of course, with these um, um, uh, data simulation approaches for, for a couple of ice ocean models, you can then also start to pinpoint what the relative merit, for example, of, of ice thickness measurements or information about wind stress or parameterization of albedo is on various, so, so the, the impact of various control variables on the predicted variable, in this case, either ice thickness or, or snow depth or ice concentration. So with that, I, I'd like to conclude this part of the presentation. Um, the key points, uh, just real brief, again, the importance of clearly defining the goals and target variables, which actually is, is um, if you deal with, with industry or stakeholder information, it's maybe more convoluted than a simple um, sort of downscaling of, of information. Um, but at the same time, the recognition that um, there's significant promise for a, a collaborative framework that uh, brings together um, folks who are, or, or entities who are in need of, of seasonal scale and sub-seasonal scale ice information and the broader research community who may have um, perspectives and insights as well as uh, models to help provide some of that information. And with that, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my desktop here and hand over for the second part to uh, Arcus for um, Adrian's presentation. Thank you, Heil. This is Betsy, and as uh, we make the transfer to Christina's desktop for the pre-recorded, wanted to uh, point out that uh, the question and answer tab will be under that green bar. Um, as previously, you may need to go over to the far right under options to select that. Um, and then type in questions. 
it looks to me like we may not have a tremendous amount of time for questions following Adrienne's presentation. Um, her presentation lasts about 27 minutes. I think we've got this going now. Thank you. Doing a quick audio check, can you all hear? Yes, we can, Christina. All right, I'm going to start Adrienne's presentation. Today I'm going to talk about industry needs for seasonal and sub-seasonal sea ice forecasts in the Canadian Arctic. The focus will be on Canada, but in general I think the discussion is probably comparable to the experience in Alaska and other Arctic regions. Uh, before I start, I want to quickly thank ONR Global for funding support and the Canadian Ice Service and National Research Council of Canada for their in-kind support of the project. So the presentation is based on results from one-on-one -on -one interviews I conducted with key industry stakeholders. I'll start the talk with a brief sketch of industry activity in Canadian ice-infested waters. Hopefully, it'll provide some context for the different stakeholder groups. I'll talk a bit about who I interviewed, and we'll run through some specific examples of stakeholder needs for seasonal forecasts, try and get across what forecasts could potentially inform decision-making in an operational setting. Then I'll review how industry needs for seasonal forecasts are being met now. So a quick review of public products that are available and from the interviews, the sense of what's being done in-house. Uh, I'll end with a review of some key results from the interviews and provide some suggestions for something. Uh, before I start, I just want to highlight that the project is a work in progress. Um, the idea is to write up something formal, uh, but before anything can be referred to, um, a draft will have to be sent to all the interview participants. Shipping is the main industry activity in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, the table on the left shows activity from 2010. So resupplying Arctic communities, there was 30 transits for cargo, 26 for fuel. For mining, there was seven cargo, two for fuel. Uh, there wasn't any for oil and gas. There's no transits through the Northwest Passage. Uh, 18 for tourism and 22 shipments of wheat from the port of Churchill. So this is activity for the Arctic only. A few notes. Um, so the wheat shipments from the port of Churchill, those are in open water only. Uh, those ships aren't ice strengthened at all. Um, the numbers for mining compared to 2010 probably um, have gone up. There's been an increase in mining activity in the Canadian Arctic. And for the Northwest Passage, um, there was one transit last summer. So the majority of ship transits were for resupplying communities in the north. Um, these activities are done in the summertime. So the map on the right, all the white lines, um, those show the main shipping routes, and the red dots are the communities. Uh, so you can see they're shipping through most parts of the Canadian Arctic. Um, to give an idea of the presence of sea ice in the summertime, on the left is the 30-year climatology, so median ice concentration. Uh, the map there is for mid-August. Um, anything in red is high concentrations of ice, so nine plus. Uh, the gray areas in the northern part of the Queen Elizabeth Islands are all fast ice, so that's 10 tenths. So this shows that even through the summer, um, a lot of the ship routes for community resupply are going through ice, and uh, most times this is done with support from the Canadian Coast Guard. So the Canadian shipping company FedNav, they support year-round shipping to three mines in Canada. The Mary River Project, uh, shipping there just started this summer. The Raglan Mine, which has been in operation since the late 90s, and Voyages Bay, which has been in operation since 2005. Um, so FedNav has polar class icebreakers, and they are independent of the Canadian Coast Guard, and they ship ore and fuel in and out of these locations uh, throughout the whole winter. Uh, the map you see there is uh, climatology, median ice concentration for February. Um, so you can see for all these locations, they're shipping through a uh, complete ice cover. So this slide shows the location of Churchill, Manitoba, so the port for wheat exports from Canada. So from the 2010 uh, summary of shipping in the Arctic, there was 22 um, transits from Churchill. So the black line is very, very rough uh, shipping route. So the ships go through Hudson Bay and then out through Hudson Strait. So there's active offshore oil production um, in Canada off the coast of Newfoundland. If you go to the map on the left, um, an area of production, um, if you go to the most northern and most west 
um, region, the number one. So that's where um, Hibernia, Terra Nova, White Rose, and Hebron are located. Um, so in spring, summer, and fall, uh, there are icebergs in the area. And in the winter time, uh, there's the threat of pack ice. So the two maps on the right, the one on the bottom, um, is a sample iceberg chart from the North American Ice Service. That's for August. And uh, you can see the numbers for each grid cell. That's the number of icebergs that were there that day. And the map on top is climatology for the area. So it's the frequency of presence of sea ice um, in the winter time. So this is for mid-March. So you can see in that in that area off Newfoundland, um, in about a third of the years, there's pack ice presence. There's been a renewed interest in oil and gas exploration in the Canadian Beaufort Sea in the past couple of years, at least until oil prices dropped this year. Uh, there's also a lot of interest um, in exploration along the northern Labrador coast and northeast northwest Greenland. Um, obviously not Canadian waters, but a lot of Canadian companies are involved in those efforts. There's a few pictures. The one on the bottom left is a picture of the Mollusk Pack in the Beaufort Sea in the 80s. And the picture on the right is seismic activity northeast of Greenland last year. So the interviews, we tried to target decision makers, planners, and people actively involved in ice management. Um, the idea to talk to people partly came out of discussions we've had here internally at the Canadian Ice Service. I've associated with the Long Range Forecasting Program here since it started about 10 years ago. And the program started um, because operations was getting a lot of requests for longer lead forecasts, and there were no models producing ice forecasts on seasonal timescales at that time. Uh, from the science side, we'd ask operations what they needed to meet clients' needs, and operations would turn around and ask us what's possible, uh, what forecasts could we potentially provide. On seasonal timescales, um, we found the balance between what's needed and what's possible is hard. Um, from the client's perspective, I think sometimes you don't know what you need until you see it, and from the researcher's perspective, it's hard to know where to put your effort if you don't know what you're aiming for. Um, so in that context, we try to keep the discussions unstructured. But a few questions um, we did ask everyone. Those were, how do you use current operational products? Um, are you aware of SIFIN? And if yes, how do you use prediction? And what seasonal forecast products would have a direct impact on the city? Um, so there's kind of three groups of stakeholders that were targeted, um, those that work directly for companies. So we interviewed people from FedNav, Husky, Chevron, Shell, and Crowley. Uh, the second group um, we have in Canada are retired um, Canadian Coast Guard captains. So these people have you know, 30, 35 years experience operating in ICE and have a good handle um, on forecasting needs. So um, I've interviewed two ex-Coast Guard captains so far. And the third group are consulting experts. So in Canada, a lot of um, expertise was developed during the offshore boom in the Beaufort Sea in the 70s and 80s. And a lot of these people are still around working as independent contractors. Uh, they advise all companies, and they often work as advisors in the field. So, so far, I've interviewed four um, people from this group. And of that group, they all had at least 20 years experience. Most had over 30. So next, I'll go through some specific examples of seasonal forecast needs from the different stakeholder groups. Uh, for shipping, seasonal forecasts are really need to assist in long-term planning. Uh, so scheduling is done months in advance. Uh, for example, the Coast Guard, they do their summer planning in the late winter. And in most cases, ice climate is only one piece of the puzzle in planning. Things like mine schedules and wildlife restrictions are equally important. Decisions that have to be made on a seasonal time scale, um, how many transits can be made in the summer, um, if icebreaker support requires. Uh, Sub-seasonal forecasts did come up in the conversation and they would be useful um, to have. Uh, so if you could accurately predict ice conditions, say two weeks, a month in advance, um, then shipping uh, shipping companies or the Coast Guard could change uh, their plans during the season. Uh, they could change the order in which communities are visited, for example, uh, or an extra uh, transit could be added to the end of the season. The key sea ice parameters um, in these decisions are break up and freeze up along shipping routes. So being able to predict break up and freeze up at specific locations. Another key point is the definition of break up and freeze up depends on the ice capability of the ship. So for shipping through Hudson Bay and Hudson Strait, uh, the requirement is open water. Uh, but for some of the community resupplies, um, 
I think it's six times or less. An interesting need for seasonal forecasts related to shipping came out of a community visit to Nain. Uh, Nain is the community that's closest to the Boise Bay Mine off the coast of Labrador. Um, the Boise Bay Mine, if you remember, has year-round shipping from, from Fedna. So the map on the left, um, all those um, routes in blue, those are local travel routes um, from the community used by the community members in Maine, in Maine uh, for visiting relatives, their hunting and fishing. And the route in red, that's the shipping route um, for the mine. So there's a southern route or there's a northern route. Uh, the winter shipping is disruptive to on-ice travel. So you look at the picture on the right, um, most of that region through those little islands into the mine is fast ice, and the ship um, cuts a region of open water through the ice. Now the ice does fill in and refreeze behind, but it's unstable and not safe for travel. Uh, so what they've done as an interim solution is after the ship passes, uh, community members put across these pontoon bridges. Um, so they're good, and they have them at a couple locations um, along the ship route. Um, but one thing that was negotiated between the local community and the mine um, was that there would be closure dates um, during the most um, active time periods where there's a lot of um, community travel on the ice, so during Christmas, um, Easter, and hunting. Um, these dates aren't set in stone. So at the beginning of the year, there's a negotiation between the local community and the mine operator to decide on the closure dates. And one thing that came out of the community consultation in Maine is that they would really like some ICE information to help in those negotiations. And so things that they thought might be helpful would be a long-term climatology of freeze-up and break-up, um, so something that goes back beyond the history of when um, shipping started in the mine, and also seasonal forecasts of freeze-up and break-up. Those would be very localized um, forecast and climatology products. So on the bottom right of this slide, um, it shows what the closure dates were for this year. So between December 7th and January 21st, and between April 7th and May 21st. For offshore oil platforms, seasonal forecasts are needed to assist in planning ice management. So again, production here is year-round, and there is the threat of seasonal ice. Um, the year-to-year -year variability in the severity of black ice and icebergs is quite large and both are managed. So if icebergs get too close to a platform, uh, they're towed away. So there's a picture of that on the bottom right. And if the pack ice uh, conditions are, are too severe, uh, they're managed through ice breaking. So large flows that are broken up or pushed away um, or ships um, can be used to create areas of open water. So again, seasonal forecasts are needed to plan the resources of prior for ice management, um, how many ships, um, how many reconnaissance flights, that sort of thing. Uh, the forecasts that are needed. Um, so for here, it doesn't have to be so detailed. Um, an accurate forecast of the severity of the ice season would be useful. Um, three categories even, uh, low normal, normal, or above normal. Um, but for a forecast to be used to actually influence decision making, it has to be quite accurate. Um, the number that gets thrown around a lot is about 80%. But in general, it has to be uh, reliable, and I think for somebody to actually use it and be comfortable, it has to have um, some history of, of being correct. For regional scale, we're kind of looking at 20 to 40 mile radius around a platform. So the need for forecasts um, to help with seismic surveys is something that came up in a number of the interviews. The requirements for a seismic survey um, is being able to predict an area that's completely free of ice for a few days. Well, the trick is that the region of interest for seismic surveys are in the marginal ice zone of the Beaufort Sea and northeast, northeast and northwest Greenland. In all these areas, there's ice in the summertime. Um, and not only is ice conditions in your in the area of interest or where the, the survey is going to happen important, but also being able to forecast ice conditions along the coast route. So below is an example from the Beaufort Sea. There's a nice paper that was written about uh, a seismic survey done in 2009 and the different sea ice grids and how they were handled. So the seismic survey was done in the area that's yellow there off in the, the Canadian boat for sea. And as important as forecasting ice conditions there was being able to predict ice conditions around the choke point of Point Barrow to be able to get in and out of the boat. So seasonal forecasts 
uh, to support size and liquidity growth, uh, but what would be required um, is being able to forecast months in advance regions in the marginal ice zone uh, that would be free of ice for a period of a few days. And this is probably completely unrealistic. Uh, but where improvements could probably be made is in uh, one to two weeks forecast. So assisting um, operators in their decision of when to mobilize and when to demobilize. In the both for tea example, uh, the limiting factor was passing Point Barrow. Uh, there is no icebreaker support. And in the paper, um, they talk about the most critical decision, uh, which was when to demobilize. So they summarize the challenge of operational medium-term prediction. So to summarize the ice prediction problem, the forecasters without ocean current data used unreliable wind predictions to predict the motion of sea ice that had been moving in unknown directions in the hours or days since the last season of satellite image. So that kind of summarizes the state of the art in an operational medium term ice forecasting. So the only seasonal sea ice forecast issued by a government agency is issued by the North American Ice Service. Uh, they issue a seasonal outlook for North American Arctic waters, one for the Gulf of St. Lawrence and East Newfoundland waters, and also one for the Great Lakes. So in the content of the Arctic outlook, there's forecasts for specific dates, uh, mainly three types of events, fracture, open drift or less, and open water. In terms of concentration, fracture um, can be thought of the change between 10 tenths and 9 plus ice concentration. Open drift or less, uh, my ice concentrations drop below 6 tenths. And for open water, bird water is when it drops below 110. So along with um, forecasts of these specific events, there's also a text description, kind of a qualitative forecast um, for ice conditions throughout the summer season. Uh, for the types of events, these are done specifically for uh, shipping routes and approaches to communities. And the qualitative description is done for, um, for all, all waters. Uh, when the forecaster is putting together the outlook, uh, it's based on past winter and spring air temperatures. Uh, we have some station ice thickness measurements. We also have an estimate of current ice conditions from satellite imagery. Uh, there's summer air temperature outlooks available from a lot of climate modeling centers and forecasting centers. And in-house, we have statistical models um, to help with predictions of some of the events. Another method that's commonly used uh, by forecasters is the analog method. So comparing the current year with previous years, um, picking out an analog year, so a similar year, and then using um, the ice, how the ice progressed in the analog year as guidance for a prediction uh, for the current year. So one thing I did ask everyone was how um, seasonal forecasts are used to inform decisions. And across the board, um, most people responded that seasonal forecasts um, were not being used to inform decisions. Um, so by seasonal forecasts here, we're talking about ones issued by government agencies. Uh, the main reasons were that they're issued too late in the season and the scale is too low. Uh, for some stakeholders, they were too broad in scale or they um, didn't cover the right region. Um, so when it comes time to decision making, um, planning all the examples that I went through, stakeholders are looking for ICE information to help with their decision making. Um, one question I asked everybody was if they were doing any forecasting and um, most people were. Um, so something, so a list here of what's being done. Uh, the first is climatology. So um, stakeholders are looking at historical ICE conditions and um, pulling out the median, earliest and latest historical dates of an event. They're using that as guidance, kind of just put boundaries on uh, on when things will happen in the summertime. Another common technique, um, common with forecasters as well, is the analog approach, looking at current conditions, comparing it to past years, and trying to pull out similar years or analog years, and then basing a prediction based on the analog year. And a few people were using empirical methods, looking for statistical relationships between um, different climate parameters and um, specific sea ice parameters of interest. So for example, one person was using um, accumulated, accumulated freezing degree days over the winter as a predictor for break of state. So some general uh, summary comments from the interviews. Across the board, uh, there's a keen interest in all seasonal and sub-seasonal forecasts, even if they don't inform decision making. So everybody was well aware of the NACE products 
and was reading them as soon as they came out. Um, and most were aware of the thing and were following community forecasts throughout the summer. So even if they're not used um, specifically um, to inform decision making, um, people are definitely uh, looking for, for information and guidance and are reading everything that's available. Um, Without exception, everyone I spoke to, there was an inherent understanding of the complexity of seasonal forecasting, limits of predictability. Most people I spoke to had 25 or 30 years of operational experience in ICE, and they understand the difficulties in forecasting on seasonal timescales, and they have a good understanding of how the ocean atmosphere influences the ice. Um, so expectations in this group are, are quite reasonable, and if not a bit pessimistic. Another summary comment, a seasonal forecast, official forecasts are not being used to inform decisions. And the main reasons here is are issues too late in the season and the scale is too low. Uh, for a forecast to have an impact on operations, it would need um, to have an established track record and be very accurate. And for accuracy, kind of 80% is the number that gets talked about. Uh, within, within industry, within companies, um, there is some seasonal and sub-seasonal forecasting being done and with a very range of complexity. So next I have a few slides on um, SIPIN and stakeholder needs. So some thoughts on how um, SIPIN can work towards addressing stakeholder needs for a seasonal status forecast. Uh, so the first is something that we're already doing and that's looking at regional predictability. So moving beyond Pan-Arctic extent and area, um, how, how localized, um, We'll see, can, could seasonal forecasts potentially have skills? Um, so stakeholders are looking for um, forecasts that are very localized so on the shale, on the scale of ships, communities, um, offshore platforms. Uh, another thing um, that we could look at is predictability at longer lead times. So the main products are issued um, in June. Um, but planning is done well before the SIP and Outlook effort begins and when the official CIS Outlook is published. So one thing um, that could be looked at is how far, uh, what lead time um, could we have skill? Um, and if predictability of ice is low, then maybe there's predictions of other parameters, um, such as the NIO, which would have skill and would be useful um, for making ice forecasts. Another thing that came up is um, predictability of a wider range of sea ice variables. So, so far, the focus has been on concentration, um, area, and extent. Um, so the first thing would be to um, look at those variables but not restricted to September, so the whole summer season for breakup to freeze up. Another thing that would be useful, um, I know the models produce thickness and volume, but if there was a way um, to discern level ice from deformed ice, uh, that would be useful in terms of navigability or traffic ability. So for traffic ability, um, we're talking about the viability of, of routes, um, so the severity of ice conditions along um, specific routes. And those are affected not only by ice concentration, but also by ice strength, ice pressure, and ice deformation. So the topic of observations, as we move towards regional uh, predictions. Uh, one question would be, um, how can local observations improve regional predictability? Regional predictability. So below are some um, figures from a paper that came out this year uh, by James Hamilton, looking at forecasts of freeze up um, using an ocean observatory. So on the left is a map of the Cane Arctic Archipelago, and where the the red is in Barrow Strait, there's an ocean observatory. One things that are measured are um, temperature and salinity in the, in the water column. On the right is a statistical relationship between freeze up date and late summer salinity at 40 meter depth. So here is an example where the local observation can be used um, to improve a regional prediction on a sub seasonal time scale. So my final slide on stakeholders is uh, some thoughts about stakeholder engagement in SIPIN. This is something I thought about um, not only for SIPIN but also for the Canadian Ice Service. Uh, one thing I thought might work well uh, 
could be informal partnerships between individual scientists and end users. So one thing that came out of most of the interviews was the willingness um, by the end users to evaluate model products and provide feedback. Um, ideally, it would be a forecast that could potentially inform decision making, but I got the sense that they would also be willing to evaluate more generic forecast products. Um, I think it would be useful for both for both groups um, for scientists to get an immediate feedback on the utility or potential utility of their forecast products, but it also give um, stakeholders um, an opportunity or venue to articulate their specific needs. So um, sometimes, you know, a categorical forecast is good enough and sometimes it's not. And uh, us, you know, sitting in our offices, I don't think we have a sense of and what's needed when and maybe um, some direct dialogue between the two groups, even at this early stage um, in the research program and in the science, um, might still be useful. Um, I think particularly that's true for the group that I spoke with. So these are people with 25, 30 years experience. Um, they're well aware of, of where we're at with the science and, and there's a keen willingness to, to help and participate. Um, the other thing I thought might be useful would be a webinar um, that involves stakeholders directly. So instead of um, basically me interviewing and, and trying to translate stakeholder needs into something that, that might be relevant for SIPIN, if this is a topic that, that people find interesting and want to push it further, then maybe, um, maybe that we could arrange something where uh, representatives from these different groups are available um, to give a talk about who they are, uh, what they do, and um, open the floor to questions. So that's the final slide. Uh, for next steps, I hope to complete all the interviews within the next uh, few weeks. Um, I do think it would be useful to document the key results more formally than the presentation. Um, before that's done, a draft will be circulated to all participants for their comments and approval. So thanks to Mian and Sipin and the group at Arcus for putting together the webinar. Um, if you have any questions, comments, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address and phone number is listed below. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's back to Bessie. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yep. I'm sorry. sorry. I thought I had unmuted both both phones. Um, so thank you very much uh, for running that presentation, Christina. We have um, actually no time left, and unfortunately our webinar does have to conclude right here at 10 o'clock. And so I do want to thank um, Mu Yin Wang for pulling and organizing this uh, webinar together. and for Hayao Aiken for his wonderful presentation and to Adrian TV for um, providing her pre-recorded presentation. If you'd have any questions or comments, please uh, contact either Adrian um, in the contact information she had. Christina, maybe you could uh, back, uh, backspace to her last presentation slide um, or send uh, questions to me at betsy at arcus.org. Um, and I imagine Hayo would be welcome, would welcome questions as well. Um, but at this time, I want to thank everyone very much for your participation and uh, look forward to our next webinar, which will be in October. At this point, we're going to conclude today's event. Thank you. Thank you.